Hello, Heather. How are you today? I'm good, Mary. How are you? I'm so good. It is so nice to see you again. Um, Heather and I connected at a Hay House event at the very beginning of December, I believe. It was yeah. like December 1st and 2nd. And it was just a, it was a small little event for people who want to become movers and shakers. In other words, it was an event for people who have a message inside of them and they're looking for the ways that they can, that they can get, be seen you know, mm -hmm. be seen so that they can promote their message or they can get their message out into the world. And Heather was chosen to kind of come on stage and give a little speech about her worthiness formula. And her story moved me so much that um, I immediately, like we connected, we had a couple of nice meals together and I wanted to set up to do this Facebook Live because the information that she has is so profound, it's so breathtaking and yet it's so simple. And there's so many things that we all have inside of us that are keeping us down in so many ways. And I think that Heather has tapped into the root of a lot of what a lot of this is about. Heather is a mother of five. She is on a mission to cure the unworthiness disease by providing us with a dose of good enough. I like that because we all are really good enough. She is yeah. the author and founder of the Worthiness Formula, a book about tips and tools she discovered along the way to her journey back to worthiness. And so Heather, um, I'm just gonna invite you to tell your story uh, just mm -hmm. the way you did it that day. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Mary, for having me. I appreciate it. And it is a message that everybody needs to hear. And for me, it started about three years ago. I was <sighs> sitting in a, in a courtroom and after a sleepless night trying to figure out whether or not I was going to be able to get custody of my children in a horribly ugly divorce battle. And um, I've not been used to any kind of court proceedings or anything like that. And I'm wearing, sitting there sweating in my cheap polyester suit and just about to hear the verdict. But right before that, I was in a recess and the plaintiff's attorney had come over to me and said to me, you know, Heather, I, I just have to tell you, if you haven't thought about it yet, you should seriously consider law school. You are the toughest defendant I've ever been against. So of course that made me feel good. And I was like, you know what, he's right. Yeah, I am, I figured it all out. I mean, you should have seen the stack of papers that I had that proved that he had lied, he was been deceitful. And, you know, so I had stood my ground defending myself because I didn't have my own lawyer. I just couldn't afford one. And so I walked back into the courtroom and even though I was very nervous, I was feeling very confident about how things were going. And the judge proceeded to give us his verdict. Um, my ex and the lawyer, his lawyer was sitting on one end and I'm sitting on the other. And the judge says in his, you know, monotone, non-empathetic voice to me, he says that, and to um, the plaintiff, my ex, you know, fool, Physical custody will be given to the plaintiff with weekend visitations for the defendant. And I was like, literally lost, lost it. I, I, I could not believe what I had just heard. And my heart sank, sank to my stomach. And I, I, at that moment, I cried out literally in the courtroom like I was the only one there. And the bailiff came and threw a box of tissue at me. And I walked out of that courtroom feeling completely worthless. And it was a uh, my come to Jesus moment, I guess I could say. And I started playing back in my head, literally like, well, how did I get to this point? What just happened? I just lost them. You know, my children, the, the one thing that I was suited for, the one thing I was born to do, that I was given this gift, and I had just lost them. And I just couldn't conceive how that could have happened. I, I was a good mom. I was a, I've been a fundraiser in my community for over 20 years, working for nonprofits. 
I had no addictions. I wasn't a druggie. I didn't drink. I, you know, I, there was just no way in my head I could comprehend how this just happened. And so, of course, the self-talk kicked in and I, you know, started replaying history like we do and thinking about choices that I had made. And I, you know, well, of course I, I don't, you know, of course I'm, this isn't, I'm not worthy of this. I don't deserve this. Of course, if maybe if I had been, you know, smart with my money, I could have had a kick-ass lawyer like him too. So I don't deserve that. And maybe if I was a little bit thinner, a little bit prettier, I could get a decent guy and have a healthy relationship. You know, and now the one thing that, like I said, I was born to do, well, of course, now I, I, I'm thinking I, I don't deserve to be their mom. And so I stopped myself there and I looked at my history and I saw this pattern of self-sabotage. And what I pinpointed was the cause of all of these decisions and choices that had led me to this point was what I believed about myself in each of those areas of my life. And I didn't believe that I was deserving of a healthy relationship. I didn't believe that I was deserving of a beautiful, healthy body. I didn't believe that I was deserving of financial freedom. And now for sure, I was had this overwhelming disbelief of being worthy of being the mother of my five children. And so I, you know, started to think about how am I going to overcome this? And um, the mama bear clause came out and I picked myself up and I just said, you know, I, I need to figure out how to find a cure to this because it's obviously self-sabotage and I don't know how to fix it. And so I started talking to people. I, I figured the best way for me to do this is to talk to people about it. And um, because of the relationships I've built in Las Vegas over the last 20 years, I had access to some pretty successful, influential people. And so I literally picked like some of the most successful people I knew. And I went to them first and I said, I, I need to ask you about this. And if you've ever struggled with self-worth or worthiness and started to have these in-depth conversations. And what I found was that every single person that I talked to was either had suffered from unworthiness or they were still suffering like myself. And they all had their different solutions, but I could see a pattern um, in their lives and they compared it to mine and I could see how I was going through this cycle and repeating these habits and these choices. And so I started to implement the worthiness formula and it was just something um, that made sense to me. And first, after I discovered like, okay, this has to do with what I believe about myself. What does it even mean to be worthy? Like, where does that come from? And let's start there first, because I don't think I even know what that means. And so I literally looked it up. And if you looked it up on your phone right now, you'd see in the definition of worthy, it says good enough. And so that's where I started. And I started applying just that definition of being worthy to everything that I did. Um, and when I interviewed people, I'd ask them to um, give me, you know, what they believed their worth was on a scale from one to 10. And then I'd ask them what other people, you know, would, would rate them. And it was very interesting to find, interesting to find out that people rated themselves lower and, but they would rate. So if I said to them, what is your husband? You know, what would he rate you? Oh, for sure. An eight or a 10, you know, but when it came down to them rating themselves, it was always lower. And so I knew that this was something innate. It was something that we believed about ourselves. And so the first part of the formula is just awareness of what it means to be worthy. And that's good enough. And also where it comes from and that it's in us. We, it's already there. And so what happens as we go through life, we have experiences, relationships, and things that happen to us, and we lose our self-worth. 
or we it's taken from us, however you want to say it, but it's still there. So it's all about how do we reclaim our worth? And and so once I understood that part, um, I realized the bigger shift was the believing that, right? Because I believe that, Mary, you're worthy, and I believe that she's worthy and he's worthy, but I'm not sure that I believe that I'm worthy. And so I literally had to figure out how do I start to create that belief in myself. Um, and so I went through learning, you know, my core values was one of the first steps and figuring out, you know, who I was and taking a deeper look at, you know, what kind of things made Heather and how do I, you know, reclaim this loss that I've had so that I can make confident decisions. And that really came from learning who I was by learning my core values and then believing that that's how and who I was to offer to the world. And, um, but that first step, let's go back to really the first step when I picked myself up, I had it cried out for help. And yes, so I just want to take a moment before we go on just to acknowledge the depth of vulnerability it takes for you to share that you were in a courtroom and you lost custody of all five of your children in, in one moment. And I know that you've told this story many times, but you know, for us, we're hearing it for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I was actually so grateful that you were the one on camera because mm. I can feel, you know, my emotions tearing up, especially as women. I mean, we can't even imagine the loss of a child in one way or another. And um, I know that we're going to, we're going to talk about what you learned from this and we're going to break this down for three steps for the listeners. And before we do that, I'm wondering if you can share, like, what's the current status of the court case? You know, yeah. I know there's more to the story and yeah. uh, I would love to, I would love to hear the conclusion and I'm sure the listeners would love to hear the conclusion of the story. Yeah. So thank you. Well, after I discovered, you know, that it was worthiness and I started to implement this formula that worked for me, um, things started to change in my life and I think then the day that I, I made this announcement at Hay House, it was such a moving moment for me because that morning, Saturday morning when I was at Hay House, I had received court papers um, from the defendants, from the plaintiff's attorney that said, I now had custody of my two oldest boys, which for me was huge. And it full come full circle after implementing what I'd known. And here we are three years later. And I went from sleeping on my friend's couch to now living on a ranch with horses and providing a lifestyle for my children that I could never even dreamed of, you know, from going living paycheck to paycheck to having over $10,000 in savings and um, creating college funds for my children. It, I mean, it was ridiculous. You know, the things that had happened once I started changing and implementing what I knew um, and within what I believed about myself and that I deserved these things. And so it what really was um, life changing and it still is. And moments come up for me where I have to repeat, you know, rinse and repeat the formula, but gosh, and, and even right now, like being able to purchase the ranch that I live on, being able to have horses there, being able to, you know, my children to come on the weekends, and also the relationship that I have with my ex-husband, you know, has never been better. It, it, before, it was, you know, very volatile, and, you know, there's a quote that Wayne Dyer, who's one of my mentors, even though he didn't know it, <laughs> said, and that is, you know, you change the way you look at things, and things you look at change, and for me, you know, I, I can never change how people are going to treat me. I can't change that, but I can change how I treat them. And looking at life from that perspective and not from the victim perspective where this just happened to me, more about how can I respond to this? Um, 
and like I said, it was mama bear that, you know, there's those mama instincts that come out and there was no way I was going to live without my kids going from being with them 24 seven, as you know, to having them, you know, only part time. I will say that everything is on purpose and the time that I was away from them allowed me to discover all of these things that I'm sharing now to write the book um, and to learn to be confident and alone, you know, and not codependent. You know, you mentioned I'm also the oldest of 11 kids. So I've never until up to that point been alone. I was always surrounded with people. So to be alone um, was at first very scary, but also a great treasure in learning who I really was. Um, and so that time allowed me, and, and I can look back at it now and see, you know, if it wasn't for the time that I had away from them, I wouldn't have had to experience that, and I wouldn't have learned all the things that I've learned. Um, but come full circle, you know, um, it won't be long before the other, my other children will be with me full time, um, where we will actually have a split schedule. And so it'll be split 50-50. Um, but like I said, it all has to do with how I responded, not necessarily how they responded to me um, and standing in my worth. So that's so beautiful, Heather. And thank you so much for sharing the, the beautiful conclusion and what can happen when you do the work. So I'm yeah. ready to dive in. And I did hear you talking about the first the first part or the entry point yeah. is really taking a look at your what it means to be worthy. Mm -hmm. And so and we talked about like the definition of worthiness. And then is that where you're looking at your core values is in this in this first part? No, that's the second part. The okay. first part is just, like I said, nobody, a lot of people, if you ask them, even look up the dictionary between, I'll tell you what, some of the research I did was the difference between self-esteem and self-worth. Okay. If you look it up on the dictionary, they're very similar. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And what I learned is that there is a huge difference between self-esteem and self-worth. And the difference is self-esteem is everything on the outside. It's how we and what we believe others think about us and, and our accomplish, accomplishments and things that we achieved, how we see and we believe what they think about us, what others think about us. Whereas self-worth is all about what we think and believe about ourselves. And there's a huge difference um, in that. And so as we start to dig into what is it that we believe about ourselves? And it's like, you know, the self-talk and the... Um, the negativity that comes into our lives, we're, you know, because of circumstances or things that have happened to us, we don't really understand what it means to be worthy. Um, I often explain also and where it comes from, that it's already in us. Um, we were born with value and value that we are entitled to everything that this work has, world has to offer. Whether we believe it or not is up to us. And so we have to get back to the point that we believe 100% that we are worthy of everything that world has to offer so that we can move forward and deliver these messages that we want to share. Because until we do that, it's very difficult um, to kind of put ourselves out there and be vulnerable and share those things. So that's really the first step is learning what it means to be worthy and, and the value that you have and that it comes from inside. It's not based upon, you know, your, your, your worth and value and how the world sees you. Right. And, you know, I've struggled with that myself as, you know, this, this book coming out and running my company and, and having children yeah. that there's sometimes I, I feel like I'm always trying to do more. I'm always trying to accomplish more. And I had this day when I just looked in the mirror and I said, okay, when is it ever going to be good enough? You know, right. and really what I was saying is when are you ever going to be good enough for your own yeah. standards because no one else is measuring you to the except level that, that for me exactly yeah i want to yeah. um, i want to read something right before we go on to uh the next part heather because yeah. there's something that and i you know you and i we felt like we were pretty aligned with each other yeah. but um a friend of mine sent me this page it's out of uh, the book conscious communication so this is page 158 i'm just going to read it so it says, I know it's easier said than done, but what if as an experiment, 
you tried to be happy just by becoming who you really are, mm -hmm. just living it and stepping into it. To get to who you really are, you have to shed layer after layer of who you've been pretending to be, layers of the person you know deep down you are not. You're shedding layers of your problems, layers of self-judgment, layers of how others have judged you, shedding layers of unworthiness, fear, worry, and unnecessary responsibilities, and layers of beliefs and challenges around what other people think you are, or even worse, think you should be. Yeah, that's the perfect description of what I've said, like the belief of self-esteem versus self-worth. And you're measuring it based on what other people believe about you instead of what you believe about yourself. And so asking yourself that question is the hardest step. Like, what do you believe about yourself? And is it all these things that people have been telling you? Is it the experiences that you've been through? Is it the relationships that you've been through? Is that really what you believe about yourself and who you are? And you'll find as you start to do, I call it the soul work. When you really start to do the soul work and figure out, you know, who is it that you are? And what gifts and talents do you have to offer this world? Um, that's, that's really when you open up um, and you become confident and you stand in your worth. So that's kind of the next step is, like I said, the believing part, you know. So the formula is A plus B plus C. A is awareness, right? Acknowledgement, awareness of what it means to be worthy and acknowledgement of that and where it comes from. B is believing that you're worthy. And so the, the steps to get to that point is, one is if you ask people what their core values were, um, many of them wouldn't be able to answer that question. They'd probably stumble over some things that people think about them and what others think about them, but most people really don't know really what makes them unique. And core values are a set of three or five characteristics that make them very unique. Um, and it's very rare that you'll find anybody has the same elements of core values. And that's how we make decisions. Literally, if you, if you start to think about it, you make decisions based on who you are, what you believe about yourself. And what I discovered is that the number one ingredient in anyone that's successful is that they're a confident decision maker, that they can say yes or no at the drop of a hat. So core values aligned with your intuition I call it the Holy Spirit, your gut feeling, whatever you want to call it, um, is how you can make those decisions. And so I went through a process of learning what my core values were. And that's kind of the second part of the belief is then you start to feel, okay, what is it that makes me who I am? What is this formula that makes Heather, Heather, makes Mary, Mary? Um, and it, like I said, it's usually three or four, maybe five different words. Um, and I actually received some really good coaching from Cheryl Richardson at the Hay House event and added this to the book. And that was, I, I went, when I went through the core values exercise, number one, faith was my number one core value. Fun was my second, which I fought for eight weeks to write down fun. So, <laughs> because to me, fun correlated with being irresponsible. Um, and so I had to accept that and it was something positive in my life. And people liked to be around me because I was fun. I brought fun to the party or wherever it was. And so it took me a while to accept that. And three was creativity, that I make decisions based on whether or not I can be creative in, in the environment or it involves any type of creativity. And the other two that I had on my list were wealth and respect. And what Cheryl asked me that day was, Wealth and respect, Heather, are those really what make you you? Or are they unmet needs? And so I looked at that and I said, she said, because once you become wealthy and once you feel like you're respected, those things really aren't important to who you are. But you always will be, what faith and fun and creativity will always be a part of you no matter what. Those things will never go away. And so what I learned is that once we start working on our unmet needs, so one of when I said wealthy wealthy falls for me under a lot of things like I want to be wealthy so I can give I want to be a great philanthropist um, I want to be financially free I want to be able to travel I want to be able to spend time with my children whenever they need me Th those were the things that incorporated wealth um, but once that is met it's not really a part of who I am it's just something that helps me become or helps me support the other things that I want to be which is faithful fun and creative 
Um, and the same with respected. I think respect uh, was because of where I was in my worth. Um, and to feel respected because of things that had happened to me or in my workplace or, you know, especially for women, you know, to feel respected is a big deal for us. Um, and you see it now more than ever. And so once I am 100% you know, and feel 100% respected, it won't matter to me anymore. You know, once I feel like that, and so it's, like I said, it's, it's more of a um, unmet need versus a core value. So learning that and going through that process is a huge part of B, believing. Because once you get there, like I said, you can make a decision. Now I go back to any decision that I'm asked, you know, whether I want to participate with something, attend an event or volunteer or serve on a board, I go back to my core values and say, well, does it fall within these three categories? And does my gut say yes or no? Because whether we want to or not, even the gut says, you know, our, our intuition is so strong, a lot of times we don't pay attention to it. Um, and that's when we go down that wrong path or take make that wrong decision. Um, and so with the, the thing about the core values, which is great, is we can say, well, does it line up with these three core values or these four core values? And what does my gut say? then you have like a solution that is 100% confident. Um, so that's a part, that's B, the belief part, um, the core values. Um, and then C is community, you know, um, and that is not only sharing your worthy renewed self with the world and all the gifts that you have, but it's also affirming the worth in other people and letting them know that they're good enough right now. It's, the good enough is you always were good enough. You always will be good enough and you are right now. It never changes. And so how do we apply that to everything? You know, every decision that we make. Um, just like you were talking about going through these things in your life and uh, trying to achieve and achieve and achieve. And at what point do you say, Man, I'm good enough. Like this is enough. And, I, and you always were enough. So how we do that is living in community and, and fellowship with other people that believe and are like-minded. You know, they say that you're the five people that you surround yourself with. Well, part of the community part is, is looking at who are those five people that you're surrounding yourself with. And, and are they the best people to bring out the best in you and for you to bring out the best in them? You know, creating a mutually beneficial relationship. So, the C part is so vital. And, and a lot of times, I've seen that people are in different parts of the formula. And so there are some people, and I'm sure we know them, who think that they deserve the world and everything that it has to offer, but they don't think anybody else does. <laughs> you know, and they've created this gap where this is us and this is those people. And that's not the truth. The truth is, no matter who you are, life is valuable. You know, and you are no better than the person that's homeless on the street outside the front door versus. And so, you know, but then so people are in different parts of the farm. So how do we get them to realize that all life is valuable and everybody is worthy of everything this world has to offer? So looking at who the people are around you and um, creating a circle of trust, you know, people that you can trust that and you can be vulnerable with that will give you feedback that is, you know, positive and maybe not so much sometimes more constructive. Um, that's the C in the worthiest formula. And that equals being worthy. So there it's pretty simple. A plus B plus C equals worthiness. So much to learn from you, Heather. This has been you know, this is, it's, it's interesting because when you have some things that are repeatedly coming up in your life, and I certainly have with worthiness and also, I mean, with the core values. So another friend of mine had been suggesting to me to do the core values exercise to help with writing and posting things yeah. on Facebook. And then this part about community, because as we begin to shift and like so many people are waking up to find out who they really are and, yeah. and discover what their gifts are, you find that your community changes. And when I'm yeah. thinking about you saying the, these people that are in your life, I think that sometimes we keep people in our lives that are a mirror to our unworthiness and they're, and they're yeah. showing us with their words and their actions that we're unworthy because we're mirroring it. They're, they're actually a mirror to what's in our own 
what's in our own subconscious. So I just appreciate that um, each part of the formula is is unique in and of itself, and it's a lesson in and of itself. And I think that what you are teaching is so beautiful. So it looks like we should looks like we should um, begin to wrap up. And I want to know where can everyone find you at? I know we've posted your site, but um, where where do you where do you want people to hunt you down at? Should they want to know more? Yeah, well, I think I'm very um, busy on Facebook, and so Facebook at Heather Estes, um, Heather Marie Estes is where you will find me, and that's where I announce a lot of the things that are going on in in my own life. Also, there is a Facebook page, and it's um, the Worthiness Formula, and it's the book page. That's a great place. I post stuff there about what's coming up with regards to the book and events, speaking events, um, and, of course, HeatherEstes.com. Instagram, too. I think Facebook and Instagram are probably the two things, social media avenues that I use the most. Um, so you can always find me there and figure out what's going on in Heather's life. <laughs> Okay. And Heather, I want to also thank you because I know that you're one of my, I know that you're one of my aspiring authors in the yes. aspiring authors online class. Um, have you, did you actually take the class yet or do you still have it? I know you're super busy, but I know you have to write a proposal coming up. Yeah. So well, I'm, I'm actually, I just you read your, you know, it's funny yesterday, um, not yesterday, the day before, I was really sick and I stayed at home and spent some time reading your full proposal because I liked what you said about the idea. If you think, because a lot of people ask me the same thing, I want to write a book and how do I get started? And so I've referred them to you, but the, the, the question you asked up is if you have enough content to write a book proposal. And so even though my book is completed, um, the draft of the book is completed, it's a great exercise to start the um the proposal process. And so I'm excited about that. I started writing the book proposal process or that proposal this week um, and really using all the information that you've given in aspiring authors, which I think is a great resource for people that want to and aspire to write a book. And I think that what you'll find is you may even go in and you're going to get more ideas. So this is what's been happening yeah. with the other aspiring authors is they say they get new downloads. Yeah. So you may find yourself even adjusting or making separate notes to the book or finding ways to make it better because really I think that it's so necessary to have that proposal and and once and so I'm I'm just so I just honor you because a lot of people would have said I've already written my book I don't need a proposal <laughs> um, but you I'm so proud of you because I know that you're going to be um, turning that into Hay House and yeah. make sure that you let me know when you hit submit and send that in. Yeah, it's great. And let you, to go um, refer back to what you just said about I found so much information and holes, actually. I, I hate to say holes, but there was things that I, I hadn't thought about until I read the proposal and had to answer those questions that you ask in the proposal process. And I thought, wow, that, that would be some great foundational work that needs to be added in that aspect. And I really started digging into more of the R&D side, the research and development, looking at different types of statistics. I mean, I had some in there, but there was some holes where I really felt like the reader needs to hear where this is coming from. And it's not just from me or from the person I interviewed, but what does the world say about this topic? And how do I go back and find the resources to support that idea or that concept? So thank you for putting that together and allowing the authors to utilize that as a resource. It's really an amazing resource for people because I don't think they get it yet until they go through it. I don't think so either. I mean, I certainly, <laughs> I certainly didn't either. And I think that that's one of the reasons I was so passionate about doing it is just because I have like you, I mean, I have so many people who say, you know, they, they walk up and they want to know how to write a book, but what they yeah. don't perhaps know is the question they should be asking is how to write a book proposal. So, yeah. and if you can write the proposal, you know, my, yeah. my mantra is if I can write an outline, I can write a proposal. And if I can write a proposal, I can write a book. And once you have the proposal, you're way more likely to get a book deal than if you, than if you didn't have it. So. Absolutely. And you probably would write, the author would write the best proposal. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that will write proposals for you, but I think it's good for the author to go through the process. Even if they have an editor that goes through it after the fact, I think the author should absolutely go through the proposal writing process first because, like I said, you you have other downloads and you have other ideas and concepts that come to you. And maybe they're for that book or maybe another book, but it's a great process to go through. And as a creative, you know this, um, 
not, not so much you because you're CEO, so you've got your, you got it down when it comes to planning. But for as a creative, it gives a great outline and, and structure to follow um, when writing. And I think a lot of writers have that challenge. It's like, how do I structurally, you know, keep everything together? How do I make a plan to write the book? And what do I follow? What's next? And because as creatives, we just want to keep on writing and writing and writing. But where's the outline? What's the chapter structure and all of that? And, and I think the aspiring authors group gives you a great outline. And, and that proposal process gives you a great outline as a creative. Yeah. And it's like you, cause you, it's almost like building a house, you know, you have to have yeah. that, that good foundation. So it's really great to be able to chat with another aspiring author because those are like my, that's what's in my heart right now. And, and all of watching all of the milestones that they're hitting, but you're yeah. also, I mean, you're hitting it so well when you're saying that the ideas come to you because of the proposal and I guarantee you Heather that you will be making some changes to your book and your yep. book will be 10 times better because yeah. you've gone through this process and um, anyway I'm just so proud of no you doubt. and you. Uh, all right well bye bye for now and hope to okay. connect with you again really soon all right thanks Mary all right bye bye, -bye. Hey, this is Mary. Thanks so much for watching. Check out a free chapter of my book, Conscious Communications at maryshores.com forward slash free chapter. The link is in the description below.